Hello and welcome to tonight's lecture. Um, this is a, this whole lecture is arranged uh, by the Center for Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, shortly known as CAMES, um, and in partnership with Wusul Academy. Um, I'm your host, Dr. Ali Ahmed Shraib, and tonight we are going to have the fourth lecture in the series of seven lectures. Uh, the, the series is uh, titled Decolonizing Social Sciences from Uniplexity to Multiplexity. So as I mentioned, this is a seven part series uh, and taking place on a fortnightly basis. Um, and the series aims to understand contemporary social science in light of fiqh, which is a form of Islamic jurisprudence. Now tonight's, um, uh, the title of tonight's lecture is actually an interesting title. Uh, what is Nazar? Question mark, pure reasoning and religious reasoning. And I'm looking forward to this very much so. Our lecturer is Professor Dr. Rajiv Shentur, who is a renowned professor and distinguished scholar in this field. He is Professor of Sociology at Ibn Khaldun University. He served as the founding president of Ibn Khaldun University from 2017 to 2021. And he has also been a researcher at the Center for Islamic Studies in Istanbul and the founding director of the Alliance of Civilizations Institute. And he also heads the International Ibn Khaldun Society. He has published widely in English, as you probably saw one of the books that uh, uh, Naim Bay had, Naim had, and uh, Arabic and Turkish on a whole range of topics, including social theory and methods, civilization, modernization, sociology of religion, and network of hadith transmission. Malcolm X, Islam and Human Rights, the list actually goes on, but uh, he also has authored several books that have been translated into Arabic, Japanese, and Spanish. So that's the brief introduction. Uh, I could actually go on a lot longer, where, but I think um, most of us who have been attending have got to know uh, Professor Shantuk, and I'm hoping that we will continue to do so. Now, a few uh, house rules tonight. Uh, we will be starting shortly with the lecture, which will last for around 30 to 45 minutes, uh, followed by the comments and the Q&A's uh, question and answer section, which will be another 30 to 45 minutes. I would request all of you uh, to keep your microphone off, switched off, and your mobile muted. I would also encourage you to take notes as uh, the lectures can be quite detailed um, and also in your question and answer session to maintain a professional approach in, uh, in debate. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to ask Professor Shen to, to take the stage and deliver the lecture, please. Thank you. Okay, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to uh, everyone from different parts uh, of the world. Uh, I'm so happy to uh, get together with you again uh, in the virtual world in this uh, uh, nice uh, gathering. Uh, I wish all of you uh, good health and uh, uh, some of you, uh, you know, uh, uh, I wish them a good night and uh, some of them I wish them good morning because I see, you know, people different parts of, of the world. Uh, uh, so Naim, uh, could you please give me permission to share my screen? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, Okay, uh, my dear friends, uh, tonight, tonight we will be uh, talking about what's Nazar, uh, pure and uh, uh, religious uh, reasoning. Uh, so Nazar is an Arabic uh, uh, word, uh, an Arabic uh, concept, uh, which is used as a translation for theorizing or uh, reasoning. Uh, and uh, it's also used in Turkish. Uh, and perhaps in Persian and uh, Urdu and other languages, uh, I believe it's a common uh, uh, common uh, word uh, in many uh, languages. Uh, but uh, as a concept, uh, Nazar has two types, pure reasoning and religious uh, reasoning. So it's a 
multiplex concept, it has two levels, two types, uh, and multiplexity incorporates uh, pure reasoning, which is sometimes called like secular reasoning, uh, not involving uh, religion, and then religious uh, reasoning. Uh, so we will be talking about these things in uh, detail in this uh, presentation, how they relate to each other, whether they exclude it, each other or complement each uh, other, and how they are brought together in a harmonious way without any conflict uh, between them uh, in the multiplex uh, perspective. So today we have a false dichotomy between pure reasoning or secular reasoning and religious uh, reasoning. But uh, from a multiplex perspective, uh, they are not mutually exclusive. Instead, they complement each other. And I will uh, demonstrate in some detail how uh, Muslim philosophers, scholars, and thinkers thought about these two methods uh, uh, and how they related these two methods to uh, each other in such a way that uh, instead of contradicting with each other, they complement uh, each other. Uh, so there are different ways to reach to uh, truth, uh, and they are used uh, today uh, in uh, philosophy and uh, social sciences. One way is using positivist methodology. Uh, the core of the scientific method of the positivist methodology is first to form questions or hypotheses, and then to obtain the knowledge through observations and experiments to either support or disprove a specific theory. So this is called hypothetical deductive uh, method. So you develop a hypothesis and you test this hypothesis by the data you uh, collect. Uh, so this is the positivist uh, methodology that, uh, that's commonly used uh, today in academic research. But at the same time, although it's not as common as positivist methodology, there's idealist methodology. So idealists usually uh, are a minority in the academia today uh, in the world. Uh, so uh, they have uh, idealist method, uh, methods, and these methods uh, study society, and they call it interpretive uh, method instead of explanatory method. Uh, the, the positivists focus on uh, discovering the causal uh, relationship uh, between cause and effect, but idealists, they focus on understanding the, uh, the, 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 the phenomenon, the, uh, the event. Uh, so that's why their method is called interpretive uh, method. Uh, so they distinguish between methods used in natural sciences uh, and social uh, sciences. So they say in natural sciences, causal explanation is an appropriate method, but in social sciences, causal explanation is not an uh, appropriate method. It should be interpretive. So the purpose of the research uh, from the idealist perspective involving interpretive methods is to understand uh, how people conceive, experience, interpret, and construct the social world, not to explain or discover the laws behind them. So these are two different uh, perspectives to uh, society. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and then uh, there is multiplex methodology, uh, which uses Nazar, pure reasoning and religious reasoning, uh, and Tasfiyah, purification of the self. You see that uh, there are two major methods used from multiplex perspective. Nazar, it involves pure reasoning, uh, which incorporates empirical uh, research, uh, and also interpretive research, and then the religious uh, reasoning, then the tasfiyah, uh, purification of the self, or the spiritual uh, 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 methods. Uh, so these methods are brought together uh, in this multiplex uh, methodology. Uh, so multiplex methodology is called in Arabic maratibul uh, usul. You may know that uh, usul in Arabic means uh, methods. And meratid means multi-layers of uh, methods. So this is what I translate to uh, English as multiplex uh, methodology. So from uh, the perspective of meratibel usul, there are two major methods. 
uh, reasoning, uh, uh, it's called nazar, and then uh, tasfiya or uh, tezkiye. Uh, so tasfiya and tezkiye, this is spiritual uh, method based on inner uh, experience, based on spiritual epistemology, uh, but uh, nazar, reasoning, it's objective and rational. Uh, and uh, uh, there are two types of uh, reasoning. Pure reasoning is called nazar akli, and then religious reasoning is called nazar shari. So nazar akli, pure reasoning, when I say pure, it means not involving divine revelation, uh, empirical and rational uh, research. Uh, uh, so uh, pure reasoning uh, as a method is used in empirical research as well as philosophical research. Uh, like natural sciences use uh, pure reasoning and uh, Ilm al-Umran, uh, which is uh, social science from Ibn Khaldun perspective, it also uses Nazar Akli. Uh, <clears throat> so both in natural sciences and social sciences, if you are after discovering causal relations and understanding what's going on, you use Nazar Akli as a uh, method, pure reasoning, without involving divine revelation. But there are disciplines like uh, Kalam, which is translated to English as theology, uh, which is a translation I don't uh, really uh, approve. It's an uh, imprecise translation. And Fikr, so, uh, and Fikr has two branches, Usul Fikr and Furu Fikr, and uh, Hadith and Tafsir, you know, uh, the discipline which studies sayings of Prophet Muhammad and tafsir, the exegesis of the Quran. So this discipline, they use Nazar Shari, religious reasoning. So religious reasoning incorporates both empirical research, rational research, plus uh, uh, divine uh, revelation uh, in addition to pure uh, reasoning. Uh, so it should not be misunderstood as if religious reasoning excludes uh, you know, uh, reason and uh, sense perception. So religious reason uh, it, it uses sense perception, uh, reason, and divine uh, revelation. So today, uh, I will introduce to you briefly uh, these two types of uh, nazar, pure reasoning and religious reasoning, and how they are used in different uh, disciplines. Uh, and uh, this classification uh, is taken from uh, Tashko Kuzade, which is a great Ottoman philosopher and thinker. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it is shared by uh, scholars like Ghazali, Fahreddin Razi, and many uh, others. Uh, almost all Muslim scholars subscribe to this uh, multiplex uh, methodology. So if we compare between two major methods, Nazar and Tasfiye, so Nazar is theoretical reasoning. Uh, it produces acquired knowledge. And this knowledge is gained through Nazar in the following manner. Uh, so you look at the ob objects, you know, collect data through uh, five senses, and then this data is transferred to one's uh, imagination. Uh, and uh, and meanings are uh, uh, abstracted uh, from uh, these uh, uh, images uh, in the mind, and they are synthesized, analyzed, or compared to other things. Uh, so this is theoretical uh, reasoning. And then the tasfiyah, which is purification of the hearts, purification of the soul, this is also another uh, method to reach uh, to truth. Uh, this is spiritual uh, method. Uh, so the knowledge gained through uh, purification of the self, it is divinely given knowledge. It's grace of God, you know, given to uh, people. Uh, uh, it is something given uh, to the heart uh, of people after the heart is cleaned from bad uh, qualities. And this process is called teskietu nefs, which means purification of the heart purification of the soul, cleansing the heart from impurities engendered by wises and adorning it with virtues is the first step. And the second step, then the heart becomes receptive to the breezes of compassion and the flows of perfection emanating from the higher realms, especially from God and angels. 
So spiritual illumination can shine in the heart. Uh, at the uh, end. Uh, so from the multiplex perspective, there is no contradiction you know, between uh, this uh, spiritual uh, effort to purify the soul and experience uh, God, experience uh, higher reality uh, and have spiritual uh, joy as well as carrying on very rational and empirical research uh, at the same time. So this is the distinctive feature of uh, uniplex uh, approach. Uh, uh, so Fahrettin Razi, who died 1220, he's a great uh, scholar. He uh, talks about uh, these two uh, methods. Uh, uh, so he said that في أن تحصيل هذه المعارف المقدسة هل الطريق إليه واحد أم أكثر من واحد? So he asked this question in the title, is there only a single method to reach the truth or there is more than one method to reach to the uh, truth? Uh, and he answered this question uh, affirmatively and he says, So he says, you know, the path to truth uh, is not a single path. There are two paths, two methods. أحدهما طريق أصحاب النظر والإسلام. One path is the path of the uh, 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 people of theoretical reasoning and demonstration. الاستدلال. You know, the, their research is based on empirical or rational evidence to prove uh, something through uh, reasoning. Uh, and then الثاني, the second path to truth, the second method, طريق أصحاب الرياضة والمجاهدة, is the path of uh, people who apply uh, uh, abstention and inner struggle. Uh, uh, so they also reach uh, to truth from a different uh, path. Uh, so uh, Farhatin Razi acknowledges uh, the legitimacy of these two methods and they should be used uh, together. Uh, okay, and uh, similarly, uh, Tashko who died in 1561, he talked about the relationship between uh, theoretical reasoning as well as the uh, Tasfiya method and to, uh, uh, to uh, describe like how they are related to uh, each other. So he said that there are two approaches the first approach is referred to as theoretical reasoning, nazar, or inference, istidlal. And the second is referred to as purification of the self, tasfiya, or spiritual enlightenment, mushahada. Uh, the first is the level of the well-grounded scholars. And the second is the level of men of truth and sincerity, as siddiqin. Each of the two approaches culminates in the other, and he who masters both is referred to as Majmu al Bahrain, you know, someone who combines together the two oceans of knowledge in himself, uh, which can be literally translated as mingling of the two oceans or uniting the two uh, oceans. Uh, so, uh, uh, for those who know Arabic, let me read the uh, Arabic. الأولى منها طريقة الاستدلال والثانية طريقة المشاهدة والأولى والأولى درجة العلماء الراسخين والثانية درجة الصديقين وقد تنتهي كل من الطريقتين إلى الأخرى. So each method leads at the end to the other one. فيكون صاحبه مجمع للبحرين أي يجري الاستدلال والمشاهدة أو العلم والعرفان. أو الشهادة والغيب. So that's the uh, uh, Arabic uh, text uh, from uh, Tashko Prozade's book, which is titled Miftah al-Sa'ada wa Misbah al-Siyada fi Mawdu'at al-Ulum. But uh, in this uh, lecture, we will be focusing uh, only on uh, Nazar. Uh, we will not talk about uh, Tasfiyah. We will talk about Tasfiyah. Uh, purification of the self as a method to uh, knowledge uh, in our uh, upcoming uh, lectures. In this lecture, we'll uh, focus only on 
uh, reasoning as part of uh, multiplex uh, methodology. Even this is a you know long uh, subject. Uh, 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 so multiplex methodology involves uh, pure reasoning, and it is used in uh, philosophy as we have uh, discussed and also in, uh, in empiric, uh, empirical uh, disciplines. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and uh, traditionally, uh, these disciplines are called ulum al-akliya, al-ulum al-akliya. Uh, it means rational sciences uh, or falsafe or hikma. These are the names uh, used for them. Uh, so here you see this multiplex methodology. It has a branch of purification of the self which is used by Tasawwuf, and then reasoning, uh, pure reasoning used by philosophy and empirical disciplines, uh, and then uh, religious reasoning used by Kalam Fiqh and uh, Usul al Fiqh. So you see that the, depending on the discipline, uh, a, a, a different method is used. Uh, uh, so this depending on the subject matter and depending on the perspective, you choose a tool from the methodology toolbox uh, provided to you by multiplex methodology. Uh, so the uniplex uh, approaches to science gives you only a single tool as a scientific uh, method to solve all your problems regardless. But multiplex perspective, multiplex methodology gives you a toolbox and lets you choose uh, the appropriate tool depending on the subject you are uh, studying. Uh, so there are two uh, different uses of pure reasoning, the, the multiplex uh, usage and uniplex uh, usage of uh, reasoning. So pure reasoning in multiplex methodology acknowledges epistemological limitations of human reason in understanding reality. So uh, uh, people who adopt multiplex perspective, they are rationalist people, but they don't say we can solve all problems with reason. They say there is a domain where it's appropriate to use reason, but reason has its limitations. We cannot answer all questions by reason. You know, we have to rely on other uh, sources of knowledge uh, as well. So, uh, but pure reasoning from a Uniplex uh, methodology perspective uh, argues that uh, human beings can encompass the reality in its totality by reason. So they are reductionists. Uh, they are trying to reduce everything to uh, uh, reason. Uh, so rational sciences, al-ulum al-akliya, are also called al-ulum al-mushtaraka, which means that they are disciplines common to all humanity. Because uh, uh, we Muslims share with non-Muslims uh, pure reasoning, uh, regardless of their religion, even if they have no religion, even if they are atheist, no problem. Because this rational and empirical methods, uh, because they don't involve uh, religion, because they don't involve uh, religious uh, approach, they are purely uh, secular. Uh, they serve as a common ground between us and non-Muslims. So we can do uh, jointly uh, together with them research, you know, using empirical methods, using rational methods uh, in the field of philosophy, in the field of uh, natural and social sciences, you know, uh, simply using empirical and rational methods, uh, no problem. Uh, uh, so that's why uh, the disciplines which use uh, pure reasoning are called al ulum al mushtaraka That means common disciplines. Uh, so uh, elements and the method of Nazar Akli. Uh, so uh, theoretical reasoning requires using concepts. Uh, these are the main elements of Nazar Akli. Then judgments. You know, these are called uh, tastikat. You know, uh, they are the uh, they are you know, compound elements of theoretical reasoning. So you have concepts, and then you bring concepts together. You make a judgment. You make a statement. 
you know, uh, and then the arguments, uh, it's also, you know, a part of uh, Nazar Akli, theoretical reasoning. And how do you make an argument, either by analogy, or by induction, or by syllogism? So, Temthil, Istikra, and uh, Qiyas. Uh, so, this is how they are analyzed in uh, multiplex uh, logic, mantuk. Uh, so, I have mentioned that uh, uh, Nazar Akli, pure reasoning, is used in philosophy. So, what's philosophy? Until the 19th century, science was considered to fall under the purview of philosophy, because philosophy was the mother science. It included all disciplines. Uh, uh, but uh, after 19th century, uh, the empirical disciplines uh, left uh, the category of philosophy. They, uh, be, uh, they came to be called uh, sciences. Uh, uh, because at that time, philosophy was a general term that subs subsumed all disciplines under itself. Philosophy and science began to branch out, uh, bifurcate with the development of the hypothetical deductive model, which locks science into a particular epistemology. For Al-Kindi, philosophy uh, is the knowledge of the true nature of things, in so far as is possible for man. So this is how Al-Kindi defined uh, philosophy. Uh, so philosophy has two branches, practical philosophy and theoretical philosophy. Theoretical philosophy studies metaphysics, mathematics, and natural sciences. Uh, practical philosophy studies ethics, economics, and politics. Uh, practical philosophy, we will uh, see uh, uh, traditionally, is called al hikma al amaliyya and under it, there is administration of self, administration of the household, and administration of the uh, city. Self-management, family management, and the uh, city management, or state uh, management. Uh, so, theoretical philosophy uh, includes uh, natural uh, physical uh, disciplines, uh, mathematics, and uh, metaphysics. Uh, I'm not going to go into details uh, of this. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, so, uh, 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 Nazar is also used as a method uh, to study uh, history uh, empirically and to study society empirically. And this is what Ibn Khaldun calls Ilm al-Umran. Uh, so in his introduction to uh, his Muqaddime, he says that uh, history and social sciences, like Ilm al-Umran, must use causal explanation. Uh, uh, and causal explanation, uh, and also theoretical reasoning, you know, ta'lil, uh, nazar, tahqiq, these are all uh, methods used by Nazar uh, Akli. So he doesn't say when you study society or history, go look at the Quran, go look at the Hadith. You know, uh, so he says, you know, use uh, uh, causal explanation, use theoretical uh, reasoning, uh, look at the cause and effect relationships. Uh, so he says history is firmly rooted in philosophy, al hikmah uh, and uh, and he says there are two levels of uh, history, the uh, external level or the surface level and the internal level. Externally, uh, history and social sciences is about just reporting the news. It's just the narrative. But internally, uh, it involves Nazar, which is theoretical reasoning, tahqiq, Verification, investigation, critical analysis, ta'lil, uh, which means explaining causality, cause and effect relationships, uh, and also ilm, how things uh, happen. So, uh, so ilm umran, uh, social sciences from Ibn Khaldun's perspective, must address why question, how uh, question, and what question. 
you know uh, so what is society why things happen in society the way they happen uh, and how uh, they happen uh, uh, but uh, uh, but ilm umran social sciences and history must do this using uh, pure reasoning uh, uh, so uh, in the islamic history there are some uh, thought experiments you know uh, which relies on uh, purely rational uh, uh, methods uh, so uh, there is a philosophical tale which is called hai bin yaksan by ibn tufail it's a very interesting book you know i recommend each one of you to get it and read it and uh, ibn sina wrote a book uh, called risalatu tayr recital of the bird you know this is an allegorical uh, treatise and flying man again by ibn sina it's a thought uh, experiment so ibn uh, sina's thought experiment flying man is very interesting it proves the existence of the soul so he says imagine that a person is created by god in mid air in a perfect fashion ie with the perfect operation of all our faculties but with his sight well and his limbs outstretched so that he's touching nothing not even his own body this person has no memories having only just been created will his mind be a blank devoid as it is of past or present sensor experience ibn sina says no he will be aware of his own existence okay uh, although he is not touching anything and he does not get any data through sense perception so he he feels that he exists uh, uh, so ibn sina gives this as a proof for the existence of the soul with the flying man experiment ibn sina concludes the following first the soul is different from the body second the body is an instrument of the soul third if the soul were identical to the body it would be impossible to be aware uh, aware of our own perceptions fourth we could suspend the perception of our own body and anything external to it we would be able to affirm that our essence which is our soul exists so major uh, philosophical schools of thought the prepatic philosophy it is uh, called mashaiya uh, and its major uh, followers uh, include al kindi farabi ibn sina ibn tufail and ibn rushd so mashaiya is the prepatic or aristotelian school of greek philosophy and its arabic followers the arabic term is a translation of the greek word prepatetic the school of aristotle who is reported to have taught while uh, perambulating with his students you know walking around and chatting uh, so that's why they are called mashai and uh, illuminationist philosophy ishraqiyya uh, it is represented by suhraverdi and molla sadra uh, the philosophical school whose name comes from ishraq which means rising of the sun and is also linked to the arabic for east is often contrasted with prepatetic uh, thought uh, is close to the plato uh, mashai is close to uh, aristotle and uh, uh, ishraqiyya close to uh, plato school philosophers critical of the philosophers before them because they are uh, they depend they depend too much on greek philosophy like ghazali ibn khaldun tashkur prozade you know they put a distance you know between greek uh, approach to philosophy and their own uh, approach uh, so they are critical of the mashai and ishraqi uh, schools uh, and then the uh, contemporary uh, muslim philosophers so uh, let me give you some examples like mustafa sabri mehmed al aini muhammad iqbal from pakistan Fabanzad Ahmed Naim, Hamdi Yazir, Nurettin Topçu, Roger Garodi, Seyyid Hussein Nasr, Seyyid Muhammad Nakib Al-Attas, Taha Abdurrahman, 
you know, these are just you know some examples of contemporary uh, Muslim uh, philosophers uh, who lived or still living in the 20th uh, century. Uh, so uh, uh, Islamic philosophical tradition still uh, goes on. It's not that uh, tradition. There are many uh, philosophers you know, uh, who maintain that tradition today in different parts uh, of the world, from Morocco to Malaysia, to France, to America, Turkey, uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, 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 so what's uh, practical philosophy? Uh, so practical philosophy studies things that exist as a result of human will and actions. So theoretical philosophy studies things that exist uh, uh, as a creation of uh, God, like nature, metaphysics, you know, these are creation of God. But uh, theoretical philosophy studies the results of human will and actions. Uh, so these things include human behavior, e e social, economic, political institutions, and theories about them. So these are all human products. You know, our actions are our product. The institutions we establish, they are our products, and practical philosophy studies uh, these things. Uh, uh, so the domain uh, or the uh, subject matters, uh, practical uh, philosophy studies, you know, uh, is very different than the domain studied by theoretical uh, philosophy. Unlike the things that belong to the domain of theoretical philosophy, these things cannot exist independently of human beings. The aim of practical philosophy is the perfection of the practical faculty through morals. It asks what we ought to do in various circumstances. It addresses fundamental questions regarding man and uh, society. How to classify domains of uh, practical philosophy? Uh, an early attempt was made by Aristotle he classified the sciences of practical philosophy into three disciplines. Uh, so ethics, household management, economics, and uh, politics. Uh, practical philosophy in the Islamic tradition is called al-hikmah al amaliyya Muslims also classified practical philosophy in a fashion that's similar to the taxonomy of the Greeks. So they also accept that there are three branches of practical philosophy you know, self-management, house management, and steam management. In Arabic, it's called Tedbirul Nafs, Tedbirul Manzil, Tedbirul Medina. You know, uh, so from the micro level of managing the self to the uh, meso level, which is managing the family, and the uh, macro level, uh, which is managing the state. So from the most micro to the most macro level of uh, management, and uh, elevating uh, the individual, the family, and the state from what it is to what it ought to be, from an ethical, moral uh, perspective. Uh, and the, uh, the underlying assumption here, you know, uh, is that uh, if you don't know how to manage yourself, you cannot manage your family, and if you don't know how to manage your family, you cannot manage your city. And another underlying assumption is that the uh, most fundamental principle of uh, administration, management at all these levels is the same, which is justice. Justice at the individual level, justice at the family level, and justice at the uh, political level, state level, uh, or the city level. Uh, so it's the same same principle uh, at the micro and the macro levels. Uh, uh, so development of uh, practical philosophy in Islamic tradition, Muslim philosophers like Ibn Sina, Farabi, Ibn Rushd, Ghazali, Ibn Khaldun, all of them believe that certain aspects of philosophical, practical philosophy did not fall under the domain of purely rational methods. So those aspects are to be dealt with the sciences which employ religious rational methods such as kalam, fiqh, usul al-fiqh. So they taught uh, pure rational thinking 
is not enough uh, for ethics, morality, and law. It needs to be combined by religious reasoning, which is used by Kelam, Fikr, and Usul Fikr. For instance, uh, Al Farabi's concept of practical philosophy is very different than Aristotle's. So, uh, in Aristotle, you have only ethics, economics, and politics, but Farabi add Fikr and Kelam, but they use religious rational methods. And uh, ethics and politics use purely rational uh, methods. Uh, so, you see how uh, pure reasoning and religious reasoning are combined together by one of the great uh, philosophers of uh, Islam. So he did not uh, imitate Aristotle. Uh, you know, he used Aristotle philosophy, but combined it with Islamic uh, perspective uh, from a multiplex approach. Uh, so Ibn Sina's uh, concept of uh, practical philosophy, Ibn Sina adapted to develop a system to achieve the balance of purely uh, and religious uh, rational methods in the domain of practical philosophy. In his early career, Ibn Sina believed that, believed that it was part of politics, Tedvirul Medina, that had to be studied by religious rational methods. He divided politics into two and came up with a fourth science. Following diagram shows classification of practical disciplines from different periods of Ibn Sina's career. So the so first period in Ibn Sina's career uh, from his book Aksam, uh, uh, practical philosophy involves ethics, household management, politics, and politics deals with kinship uh, related to prophecy and divine law. So Sharia is part of uh, politics. Uh, you see how he combines uh, the two, uh, not just following the uh, uh, footsteps of Aristotle. So in second period, uh, Ibn Sina, in his book, Danish Name, uh, uh, wrote that uh, practical philosophy involves ethics, household management, politics, sharia, like the, uh, the, the religious law, uh, and it's the foundation, and siyasat. So sharia is asl, sharia is foundation, and siyaset is fara, branch. So the root is sharia, branch is politics you know, uh, in the second period uh, of uh, Ibn Sina's perspective. And this, in the third period in his intellectual life, uh, which is uh, reflected in his book, Mantak al mashriqiyin uh, he wrote that uh, uh, practical philosophy uh, includes legislative art, ethics, household management, and politics. So you see he elevated Sharia at the top and put the others uh, under uh, it. Uh, so the limitations of pure reasoning in practical matters, according to Ibn Sina, like why he brought in Sharia, uh, divine law, uh, and why he was discontent simply using uh, pure reasoning in ethical and normative issues. Uh, uh, so he argues that the, the existence of prophecy, human species need for Sharia for their existence, survival, and future life. So they need prophets, messengers of Allah. You know, uh, they need Sharia. Why they need prophets and Sharia uh, to be able to maintain their existence, survive, and also their future life in the hereafter? You know, they need this. Uh, and also he argued that the wisdom in the universal commands and prohibitions uh, that are common to all religious laws and in the commands and prohibitions pertaining to a particular Sharia according to each particular people and particular time. Uh, so uh, the religious laws uh, brought by messengers of God have two types of laws. One type of law, they are permanent, universal. They are primordial. They never change. For instance, uh, uh, inviolability of life, private property, 
you know, family, prohibition of adultery, you know, prohibition of interest. These are universal. But then some laws change from one uh, profit to another uh, profit. Uh, so the difference between divine prophecy and uh, and all false claims, you know, we need uh, prophets to be able to distinguish between real divine revelation and false claims for divine uh, revelation. Uh, so Ibn Sina later developed this system further and reached its culminating point in his al hikmah al mashriqiyya Eastern philosophy. He developed an independent meta-category meta of practical philosophy and called it the discipline of prophetic legislation, as sanaa al-Sharia. And according to him, this part of practical philosophy is needed by the person who seeks salvation in the hereafter. Okay, so practical philosophy, the secular practical philosophy, may contribute to your happiness in this world. But you need religion uh, if you want uh, happiness in the hereafter. If you want salvation in the hereafter, you need religious law. That's why he added uh, as part of practical uh, philosophy. So that practical philosophy uh, wouldn't be limited only to this mundane life. It should incorporate the hereafter uh, as well. Shehristani, uh, he also argues that uh, religious reason is necessary to complement uh, pure or secular uh, reasoning. So Ibn Sina's uh, approach became very influential in the later periods of Islamic philosophical tradition. Muslim philosophers claim that the whole domain of theoretical philosophy with their purely rational methods whereas partially left the practical philosophy to religious rational reasoning. Shehristani states this in the following paragraph. Seeking help from others in practical philosophy is much more necessary than that is in theoretical philosophy. So in theoretical philosophy, you can figure out things, how they work in nature, for instance. But when it comes to practical philosophy, ethics, law, economics, politics, you need help from other sources. Uh, the prophets, peace be upon them, supported practical philosophy by their spiritual guidance uh, 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 completely and in detail, but they supported theoretical philosophy only in a limited way. Philosophers undertook the rational guidance to theoretical philosophy completely and in detail, but they supported practical philosophy only in a limited way. Uh, so Shehristani drawing our attention that uh, pure rational reasoning is has less power, you know, in practical, ethical, legal, political, economic domain. Uh, it needs support of divine revelation. Ahlak uh, Alai, it's authored by. Kanalzada Ali Efendi, who died in 1572. So the book is authored in uh, Turkish. Uh, it's called Ahlaki Alai. Uh, so it's a book on uh, practical philosophy, uh, maybe the best Ottoman book on practical philosophy. So Ahlaki Alai may be seen like the Nicomachus Ethics in Greek. Uh, you know. uh, so the book has three sections Ilmul Akhlaq or ilmi tedbir nefs you know, individual morality or self management and then ilmi tedbir menzil you know management of the household then ilmi tedbir medina is political science or political uh, ethics uh, it talks about justice justice or law as the organizing principle of society city governance circle of justice you know how you run an army circle of justice these kind of issues uh, are discussed under Ilmi Tedbiri uh, Medina. Uh, so where to use pure reasoning? Ibn Haldun's criticism of philosophers. So in order to understand the metaphysical world, philosophers such as Farabi, Ibn Sina, and Ibn Rushd use pure reasoning. 
by using Nazar Akli, uh, pure reasoning in the metaphysical domain, they come up with a cosmology based on the theory of sudur, which means emanation, not creation, emanation theory. Uh, however, Ibn Haldun criticized these philosophers for they use pure reasoning in an inappropriate ontological domain. So he argued that uh, uh, in the metaphysical world, reason doesn't work uh, because uh, reason works only in natural, uh, in, in, nat in, in the study of nature, uh, in the study of uh, like empirical world. Uh, but when it comes to metaphysics, there is no observation, there is no experimentation. How come you know uh, you get to know the metaphysical world? Uh, so he wrote <laughs> that the philosophers uh, who uh, uh, who or metaphysical philosophers al hukama al ilahiyun make conjectures about details concerning the essences of the spiritual world and their order. Uh, they call these essences intellects. However, none of it is certain because the conditions of logical argumentation as established in logic don't apply to it. So logic doesn't apply to the metaphysical world. You know, uh, empirical methods don't apply to the metaphysical world. Uh, one of these conditions is that the propositions of an argument must be primary uh, and essential but the spiritual essences are of unknown essentiality. Thus, logical argumentation cannot be applied to the metaphysical world. Our only means of perceiving something of the details of these worlds are what we may obtain from methods of religious law, Sharia, as explained and established by religious faith. Of the three worlds, the one we can perceive best is the world of human beings. Uh, uh, so you see this is how uh, Ibn Khaldun criticizes uh, philosophers who try to understand everything by using uh, pure reasoning. Uh, Nazar uh, Akli. So he warns them, you know, there is a limit to pure reasoning. Actually, they are also aware of it, uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, the question is not awareness about the limitations of uh, pure reasoning, because uh, as we have uh, already seen in the taxonomy of the sciences uh, you know, or practical philosophy, both uh, Farabi and Ibn Sina, they were aware about the limitations of uh, you know, reason. Uh, however, uh, Ibn Khaldun thinks you know, they, uh, they uh, overextended, you know, they stretched <laughs> reason too much. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, so limits of pure reasoning in, in the matters uh, about the metaphysical world, not all existing things and their causes are accessible to human mind and senses. Some aspects of the reality lie beyond the intellect and human comprehension. Uh, train of prophetic knowledge is not against human intellect, however, it's about it and informs us about the higher level of existence. So Ibn Khaldun says intellect is a correct scale. Intellect is a proper scale, it's a proper measure. However, the intellect should not be used to weigh such matters as the oneness of God, the other world, the hereafter, the truth of prophets, the real character of the divine attributes, and anything else that lies beyond the level of the intellect. So one might compare it with a man who sees a scale in which gold is being weighed and wants to weigh mountains in it. Uh, so the uh, extents and limits of human knowledge, reason and uh, revelation, uh, uh, is reason the ultimate source of uh, knowledge? Uh, what's the role of divine revelation? Uh, so this issue uh, has been discussed over centuries by Muslim uh, philosophers. Uh, uh, so 
uh, there are two interesting uh, fiction. Uh, one is called Hai bin Yaksan, the other is called Fadl ibn Natik. Uh, so uh, the, uh, Ibn Tufail, uh, this great uh, philosopher, you know, he wrote Hai bin Yaksan. And in that book, he argues that reason alone can arrive at truth about reality autodidactively that's in harmony with revelation. Uh, a dissociated view of relationship between reason and revelation. Uh, and, uh, and Ibn Nafis, in his book, Fadl Ibn Natik, you know, he argues that reason points to the necessity of revelation and revelation relies on reason to establish its own authority. A more dialectical and interactive relationship between reason and revelation. So Ibn Tufail argues that autodidacticism uh, can lead to the same religious truth as revelation. So that means, you know, uh, like if you live in an island uh, without speaking and seeing anyone uh, and completing, uh, you know, deliberating and thinking by yourself alone, you reach uh, some truth, which is the same as the truth revelation, divine revelation teaches. Whereas Ibn Nafis believed that the religious truth can only be attained through receiving divine revelation or learning, the learning about the uh, teachings of the divine revelation. So. My, uh, which is presented through countless interactions with other humans while Hai lives alone with animals on a uh, deserted uh, island. Uh, so these are just uh, you know, uh, two uh, thought experiments uh, and both Ibn Nafis and Ibn Tufail wrote these, these like fiction novels. Uh, to demonstrate their view on the relationship between reason and uh, revelation. Uh, so, so what's religious reasoning, Nazar Shari? Uh, so in the multiplex approach, pure relational methods have their perspective domains of inquiry. They are not sufficient to provide the answers to all sorts of practical questions. To answer some questions, one needs to use aided reason. In other words, reason requires an additional epistemological source to support uh, itself. This may be called aided, supported, helped reason. In Islamic tradition, this sort of reason is called Nasar Shari, which is literally translated as religious reasoning. Religious reasoning is the formal reasoning which relies on a sacred text or traditions for uh, some of its uh, premises. Religious reason provides guidance to understand God and his creation, his relation to this world and to human beings. Uh, because uh, these issues cannot be properly, clearly addressed by human mind. Human mind has limitations uh, in these issues. Uh, uh, so the epistemology of religious reasoning in the multiplex epistemology, there are three objective sources of knowledge, uh, sound senses, reason, and true report. Al-Hawas as salima Al-Aql, and Al-Khabar as-Sadiq. Each one of these sources is valid within their own realm. See, you know, uh, there is an appropriate domain where you use your mind. There's an appropriate domain where you use your senses. And there's an appropriate domain where you use the true report which is the Quran and the Hadith uh, and other reports. Uh, so Quran and Hadith is not sufficient alone. You know, mind is not sufficient alone. Empirical research is not sufficient alone. You know, they need to be combined and used all together, but in different domains. Uh, each one of these sources is valid within their own realm. Religious reasoning uses these uh, three sources of uh, knowledge. Uh, uh, so religious reasoning does not mean relying only on the sacred scripture. You know, religious reasoning relies on both reason, sense perception, and uh, sacred uh, scripture uh, at the same time. Uh, 
so one of the disciplines that use uh, religious reasoning is called kalam. So it is imprecisely related to uh, English as uh, theology. Uh, kalam literally means speech, discourse, or conversations. Uh, its meanings uh, it also include discourse, discursiveness, argumentation, or disputation. Is also known as ilm al kalam, ilm usul al din, ilm al akaid, ilm al akida, ilm al tawhid, ilm al tawhid was sifat, ilm al nazar was istidlal. So these are some of the uh, different names used for uh, ilm al kalam. In English, kalam has been translated as the science of dialectics, dogmatic theology, Islamic speculative theology, natural theology, or philosophical theism. However, many scholars now prefer to use kalam instead of translating it. So it would be more authentic and uh, precise. Uh, uh, so Taftazani, in his Sharh al uh, he wrote that, uh, you know, Hakaik al Ashai Thabitatun. So he said uh, uh, that uh, uh, there is truth, uh, there is truth, you know, uh, and well, ilmu biha mutahakkikun, and we can have certain knowledge about truth. You know, the post-truth era, <laughs> you know, they are rejecting truth. Uh, you know, uh, so this is the first sentence in this book on Islamic aqidah. So he says there is truth, and truth can be certainly known, but this is in contradistinction to the Sophists. The Sophist is a group of philosophers who lived in ancient Greek, Greece. They argued that there is no truth. Okay? <laughs> so they are the pioneers of post-truth people today. You know, the postmodernists today, they claim there is no truth. So their grandfathers lived in ancient Greece and they are called Sophists. And Aristo and Plato fought against those Sophists that there is truth <laughs> uh, and truth can be known. So there are people who argue there is no truth and there are people who argue even if there is truth, we cannot know. So they are agnostics. You know, uh, yeah, so there are Sophists, there are agnostics and then there are skeptics. They say, oh, even if we know uh, the truth, we can never be sure 100% uh, whether it's true or not. Uh, so here in the first sentence of the Akida book, you know, uh, it says there is truth and we can know truth by certainty. So there is no doubt that we can know uh, the truth. Uh, uh, so this against the sophists uh, who argue that uh, the, you know, there is no truth, uh, uh, which is a uh, old idea resurrected today as postmodernity as if it's something new. You see, it is a very old idea and the Muslim philosophers, they were aware of the existence of such an idea and they were uh, uh, explicitly uh, rejecting it. Uh, and uh, also the book states that uh, uh, there are three sources of knowledge al hawas al salima al khabar al sadiq wal aql so uh, sound sense perception reason and also divine revelation which is re reported in a reliable way so these are the three sources of uh, knowledge uh, so uh, this is you know uh, the beginning of al aqid al aqaid and nasafiya between mai umar bin muhammad and nasafi so in conclusion uh, theoretical reasoning, Nazar has two types, pure and religious. Nazar Akli, Nazar Shari. The sciences that operate within the boundaries of purely rational methodology are called either the rational sciences, Al Ulum Al Akliya, or philosophy, Falsafa, or Hikmah. At that time, they are also called Al Ulum Al Mushtaraka, the common disciplines between us and non Muslims. So, Nazar Akli is the common ground between us and uh, non-Muslims, and the disciplines built on Nazar Akli, they are common disciplines like physics, chemistry, biology. These are common between us and non-Muslims. Uh, all sciences which used rational and empirical methods were subsumed in the past under philosophy, 
Later, natural sciences gained their independence from philosophy and started to be called empirical sciences. Each domain of existence requires different type of epistemology. Uh, both pure and religious reasoning are valid in our quest to acquire knowledge. They don't exclude, but complement each other. All right? Uh, so this is the end of my uh, presentation. And I am closing the uh, PowerPoint. Now ready to uh, hear your contributions, questions, suggestions, objections, anything <laughs> you want to say. Um, Dr. Ali, we cannot hear you. Could you unmute yourself? Please? Yeah, uh, sorry. Thank you, uh, Professor Rajab. Uh, uh, very, very detailed and a whirlwind of a, a, a tour, actually, on the issue of philosophy and the and the thoughts and the branches of it. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I think we have quite a few questions on the chat box. So unless there's a burning question, I'd like to lead with that today, actually. And if anybody would like to ask a verbal question, please do uh, put your hand up. I will take those questions from you um, and I will ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, and um, uh, is there a hand up, Naeem, I see? You want to yeah. ask a question first? Uh, I can start actually, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, okay sure. then, I'll, I'll give you the permission today then, go on. Well, uh, thank you, Professor. It has been a pleasure uh, to hear your lecture and thoughts on the, on the, on the topic. Um, with regard to the uh, modern Islamic philosophers, uh, you mentioned about uh, Said Hussein uh, Nazar and uh, in his book, Islamic Philosophy from its uh, origin to the pre present. And um, I had the opportunity to read the book. And what happened uh, is that he seemed to be um, mention the philosophers of a particular uh, school of thoughts. He prioritized them there. Uh, and uh, a lack of inclusivity was there. I mean, that, that was really, seemed to me, a, a kind of partial uh, view of Islamic philosophy. So that's the one part I want you to comment. The second part is, um, he, emphasized, he actually divided the philosophy in two ways. One is like um, uh, al-Hikmat al-Ilahiyah, one and another one is uh, Kalam. So this, these are the two parts he, he thought about. Mm -hmm. So what's your thought on that? Uh, on that? I mean, it seemed to be that uh, he, there is no mention of multiplexity or multiplex approach of uh, uh, Islamic uh, perspective of uh, philosophy. So could you comment on that, please? Thank you. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, nobody is perfect, you know, uh, and nobody is uh, immune of uh, mistakes. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, like everyone uh, uh, makes mistakes and uh, uh, so, you, but whether you agree or disagree, you know, these are uh, considered uh, respected thinkers and philosophers in today's world. Uh, 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 and uh, they have a particular perspective in issues. So, you know, you may disagree with them in certain issues, but we have to mention their names, you know, as we list, you know, uh, contemporary, uh, Muslim uh, philosophers, uh, and uh, but the, the fact that he makes a list of al uh, uh, al and al kalam shows that he is aware of the multiplexity, uh, because al uh, al this metaphysics from a pure rational perspective, and kalam incorporates uh, religious uh, uh, sources as well, so he is aware of it, uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, this classification demonstrates that uh, uh, it's similar to what we had. You know, uh, there is uh, philosophy and kalam. So he's okay. also following that uh, tradition. He says there is, you know, uh, there is uh, al hikma al ilahiyah that means metaphysics from pure rational uh, perspective, and also al kalam, you know, uh, which uh, incorporates uh, religious uh, reasoning. But of course, uh, he may not be, you know, using the same uh, perspective. He may have a different uh, approach uh, to the issues. Uh. Thank you, Professor Rajab. Can I just take a couple of um, uh, questions in the comment box? Um, Elif Yalchin uh, asks, what is the relation between the, the heart, qalb, and mind, aql? Are they separate? 
or related? Can we really have a pure reason without emotions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a very interesting question. Uh, where is Akul? You know, where is reason? You know, from uh, the perspective of Eastern human ontology, Akul is in the heart. You know, and Muslims think with their heart. And it's made explicit in the Quran in many verses. You know, that uh, Muslims think with their heart and when the heart uh, dies, uh, they can no longer think. Uh, so thinking is a function of the heart, not the mind. You know, uh, uh, but mind is an instrument of the heart. Uh, so from Islamic uh, human ontology, there is body, there is mind, and there is heart. So mind you know, is also called dima or zihin. You know, it is the functions of the brain. But the heart is a spiritual entity. Uh, it's a metaphysical entity. Uh, and the reason is uh, a function of the spiritual heart. You know, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and Muslims, uh, or actually all human beings, you know, uh, think with their heart. And heart uses brain as an instrument. And brain uses body as instrument. So the data collected uh, through uh, sense perception is transferred to the brain, stored in the brain through memory. Uh, and the heart retrieves uh, this uh, knowledge from the brain and uh, uses them. And the brain uh, serves as a mediator between the spiritual heart and uh, the body. Uh, so from this perspective, uh, so we have to uh, like revise this question, you know, a <laughs> little bit. Uh, you know, uh, so we think, you know, with our heart and emotions, uh, uh, you know, they are uh, uh, in our spiritual uh, heart. Uh, so our reason and emotions, they all exist uh, together in our spiritual heart. And sometimes there's a conflict. You know, between those emotions, uh, 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 and some of them are called nefs. You know, uh, nefs. So uh, you have to take into consideration this uh, uh, Islamic human uh, ontology. Uh, then you can ask proper uh, questions. You know, from that uh, perspective. Otherwise, you know, uh, uh, if you use like a Western human ontology. Uh, which uh, accepts that there is only like a body and mind, no soul, <laughs> then, you know, uh, 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 you know, there is a, a confusion. So once I was invited to give a talk about the conflict between mind and heart, you know, between uh, uh, mind and heart, mm -hmm. I said, uh, there cannot be conflict between mind and heart. Because uh, you know we think with our uh, hearts, but there is a conflict between nefs and akal. Nefs and akal, you know. Uh, but I said because in Western human ontology there is no nefs. You know they don't have nefs in their human ontology, so you misidentify the conflicting elements, the source of conflict. <laughs> You know, uh, so they think there's a conflict between heart and mind, you know, heart and yeah. akal. Uh, but the real conflict is between akal and nefs. Thank you. Thank you. So we do actually have a, quite a few questions um, on the chat. Um, the second one I'd like to sort of, uh, unless somebody's had a burning question, raise their hand. Uh, this is a question uh, by, uh, uh, what is it, Masum, uh, who says, how does multiplex philosophy or way of addressing matters deal with issues like proportionality and priority? Do we solve poverty first and then pursue space travel and satellite technology deployment for maintaining technological edge, for example, or can we pursue both, one or both, and in what proportion in terms of resource and effort allocation? Mm -hmm. Yes, so, uh, so this is a very good question. Uh, it's about practical philosophy, uh, you know, uh, especially uh, in uh, Fukuh. Uh, so uh, Fuku uh, divides human needs into three categories, Daruriyat, Hajiyat, and Tahsiniyat. 
So the absolutely necessary needs and uh, the needs that should be met and aesthetic needs. You know, so like you need a home to stay, but uh, to have like nice furniture in that home, it's hajiyat. But to have paintings on the walls is aesthetic needs. So there is daruriyat, there is hajiyat and tahsiniyat. Uh, so we have to give priority to uh, serving the uh, daruriyat, the absolutely necessary needs, then the hajiyat, then the uh, tahsiniyat, the aesthetic uh, needs. Uh, so if some people die from hunger, you know, <laughs> uh, you cannot spend money on aesthetic needs uh, because some people, you know, uh, they need, you know, uh, absolutely necessary uh, things, uh, uh, and without providing them and letting them to die from hunger, it's not a good idea to spend all this money on, you know, uh, on like sending people uh, to the space. Uh, so you need to have justice uh, uh, in the distribution of uh, resources uh, and give priority to uh, human needs. Uh, yes. So thank you. Uh, Professor, your lecture has definitely triggered off a lot of people's uh, interests and questions today. So we do have quite a, a good uh, set of questions. Next one is from the Islamic literature, I think is uh, uh, Abdul Hai, who says, if reason can be used to attain human value equal to that of religion, according to Ibn Tufail, then what role do Prophet and their message play? Yes, uh, so this is a very good question. The role of the Prophet is to expedite the process and also confirm, you know, from that perspective. See what I mean? Uh, so uh, Ibn, Ibn Tufail and people like him, they say, uh, like, we can discover the fundamental truth, not the truth in detail. You know, we can discover, like, basic norms, but not all norms in detail. You know, uh, so let's say killing is bad. We can discover this, you know? Uh, uh, and then stealing is bad. You can discover these things, you know, but uh, uh, not all uh, uh, norms in uh, detail. Uh, so they say prophets, uh, you know, divine revelation, uh, help us in confirming like what we arrived by using our mind is the right thing. First, second, not everybody's philosopher. You know, uh, not everybody has the leisure, you know, uh, to dedicate his life to uh, do research about uh, the truth, the reality, and all the norms and everything. You know, we need ready uh, things, like you are a doctor, right? <laughs> you have to go and take care of the patients. You cannot spend your time, you know, what is the right thing to do? What's morality? What's ethics? And how should I behave in every issue? So divine revelation is needed for you so that you receive, you know, certain things ready, but you use your mind to check uh, whether what you receive is, you know, compatible with your mind and uh, not, but you realize, okay, these are compatible with your reason uh, as well. So reason is still a judge, you know, uh, uh, to, uh, to judge that, uh, you know, what's presented to you originates authentically from the divine source. Uh, uh, so this is how uh, they, uh, th those philosophers, you know, uh, and uh, the, the Mu'tazila also believes the same way, mm -hmm. but the Ash'ari and Maturidi scholars, they say, no, 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 you know, uh, our mind is not enough uh, you know, uh, to uh, know the truth. Uh, you need divine revelation to tell you what's the right thing to do. So mm -hmm. they have different schools of thought on this uh, issue. Any anybody? Thank you. That, that's definitely helpful there. Uh, yeah, uh, hands gone up. Uh, Rubaiyat Yamin, would you be kind enough to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Professor. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, I had two questions actually. So one question is related to. Sorry for the background noise. So I'm just gonna. Um, so one one of the questions is uh, if you uh, you know following up from your uh, discussion on the ontological status of the heart. If we try to connect this with uh, modern neuroscience, and if we sort of uh, 
see that the certain aspects of the brain, physical aspects of the brain, uh, uh, provide some of the functions, seem to be correlated with certain functions of the mind, like cognition, like, you know, uh, certain aspects of the brain, if you don't, uh, if they're impaired, then you will not be able to uh, uh, think rationally, or you might not be able to, mem uh, you know, have a good proper memory. So is there a connection in Islamic uh, uh, philosophy or uh, kalam or whatever, in, in this multiplex method, to connect the ontological status of the heart, the mind, and the physical uh, you know, status of the brain. I mean, is there like how, how's that connection developed? Yes, uh, I saw. So I yeah, I recommend you to read uh, Imam Ghazali's uh, chapter on uh, the heart in his uh, revival of uh, Islamic uh, sciences, Ihya Ulumuddin, you know, Kitab al Kalb. It is translated to English as the marvels of the heart. You can find it uh, and uh, read it. There, he explains in detail uh, that, uh, you know, uh, brain has these functions of imagination, uh, memory, uh, uh, and, uh, and other uh, functions, you know, the cognition, etc. These are all in the brain. But brain is a tool of the spiritual heart. Uh, so uh, there is a superior... Uh, uh, element, there is a superior entity in the metaphysical world which controls the brain as well. Uh, so uh, the brain is not its own master. The brain serves a master who is above in the metaphysical world. Uh, so all these neurological functions, they are uh, you know used by the spiritual uh, uh, heart uh, so brain is a tool uh, of uh, that spiritual heart. So if something goes wrong, that means there is something wrong in the instrument uh, uh, of the brain, uh, which is used by uh, the spiritual heart. So, so the highest command center of a human being is not the brain. Oh. No, so the brain is uh, under the control of uh, this higher uh, 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 mechanism uh, which belongs to the uh, uh, spiritual and metaphysical uh, world. Uh, so all the functions you mentioned uh, studied by neuroscience, you know, uh, they are there, uh, we accept them, but we also accept that, you know, uh, they are controlled uh, by a, a superior uh, source which is the uh, soul, uh, the spiritual heart. Uh, I hope uh, this is enough as a brief uh, answer. Yeah. Thank I'm you very you. much. Uh, uh, thank you very much. That, that was very illuminating. Uh, I just had another question, if you would yes. allow me. Yes. So this, this question has to do with the uh, idea of reason, being able to, uh, being able or not being able to understand uh, uh, the creator or the nature of the creator. So, so I'll, I'll, uh, my specific question is this. So we see in uh, among our theologians that they use uh, the cosmological argument or uh, the 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 imkan, the uh, contingency argument, to establish the existence of a, a creator, the necessity for the existence of a creator, and certain attributes. Mm -hmm. uh, like choice, like irada, like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, like elm and uh, other things, uh, oneness, existence. Mm -hmm. So my question is, when the, 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 uh, the scholars, the, uh, the school, I've heard in your lecture that there's some scholars who are saying, some schools of Islamic philosophy, who are saying that you can't reach, uh, you can't uh, understand, uh, you can't uh, understand Allah to your reason. So what do they, specifically, what do they mean? Like, like, do they mean that we can't even reach, like, because the people who demonstrated used, uh, like, you know, the ontological argument or the uh, Kalam cosmological argument to uh, establish the existence of God, they've used uh, Akal, purely Akal. I don't see them using anything else. Like, they're not using any uh, religious uh, text mm -hmm. or anything like that yeah. to establish yeah. these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, they don't, they don't contradict with each other. 
Okay, uh, so what they, yeah. they say that uh, you can discover existence of God, oneness of God, that God is beyond <laughs> any, uh, imperfection. You know, uh, He's like all perfect, uh, and there is no imperfection in God. So these are the basic things, the fundamental things. Like He's eternal; He must be eternal. He must be one. You know, He must be uh, omniscient and. Uh, you know, uh, he must have like unlimited power. So these things you can discover by your mind, but uh, nothing more than this. You know, when it uh, comes to like uh, detailed attributes of God, uh, you need uh, God to introduce himself to you. Uh, so you can discover, discover some of the fundamental things, but not everything by using uh, your mind. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, but uh, some of those philosophers uh, who are rationalists, they argue, no, we can know God perfectly, completely, simply by using our minds. Uh, but Muslim philosophers, they say, no, uh, your mind uh, helps you to discover existence of God, oneness of God, perfection of God, but not everything about God. You know, not everything about the hereafter, about paradise, hellfire, day of judgment, you know, like all these things uh, which belong to the metaphysical world. Uh, you need uh, God to tell you, you know, uh, what's in paradise, what's hellfire, how uh, day of judgment is going to take place. So these are things that you cannot discover by your mind. So even if you discover some of the fundamental elements, you know, uh, you cannot know everything in detail, uh, simply using uh, your mind. So uh, divine revelation must uh, help and complement your rational uh, thinking. So this is what they say. Thank you, Professor. Um, we have probably uh, five minutes. Let's see how the um, uh, uh, you know, session goes. Uh, we don't have much time left. Uh, we want a contribution or question from one of our regular participants, Rajiv Kumar, who has asked, uh, is thanking you for the presentation, asking, uh, uh, is that the considering multiplex method methodology, you specify two sorts of nazar, nazar shari and nazar akli. The foundation of nazar shari should be kalam, fiqh, hadith, and tafsir. Uh, so how may non-Muslims reach the truth using multiplex methodology? Is it necessary for them to study Kalam, Fiqh, Hadith, and Tafsir? Uh, uh, so there are levels of truth, like narratable uh, haqqaiq, levels of truth. So the fundamental level of truth, uh, as I have mentioned in my previous answer, uh, can be discovered, can be accessed through pure reasoning. But if you want it in detail, you have to uh, uh, use uh, religious reasoning as well to complement it, which does not contradict with your uh, 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 rational uh, conclusions, but supports it and extends it uh, further. So non-Muslims, as I have mentioned, we share this common ground with non-Muslims, this Nazar Akli, it's the common ground. You know, we share this with them, you know, uh, and it's enough to discover the fundamental uh, primary facts about uh, normativity, uh, about uh, uh, truth, about reality, about God, you know, uh, but only fundamental uh, facts. Uh, but if you want like normative life, ethics, morality, law in detail, you know, you need divine law, you know, you need divine revelation. If you want detailed knowledge about the metaphysical world, you need divine uh, revelation to complement your rational uh, findings. Thank you. And Behzad Zibari has asked, um, basically said, uh, you touched upon the wisdom of religion and prophets as mentioned by Ibn Sina. Uh, are there any classical works by Islamic philosophers that discuss the topic of religion, prophets, and worship from a rational and philosophical perspective? If there are, could you mention a few or for, that come to your mind? Are there any yeah, particular yeah. things? 
they all do this. They all. <laughs> you know, uh, they all do this. Uh, I mean, like uh, all the books of Kalam, uh, all the books of Fuku, you know, uh, they all uh, have this, but not the simple ones, you know, the advanced ones. The simple ones only give you the rules uh, because they are like primary books uh, for uh, general public or for children. They only have rules like believe in these things, do these things, but uh, high level uh, fiqh text or kalam text, they're all rational. Uh, they combine you know, uh, uh, pure reasoning as well as uh, uh, religious reasoning. For instance, there is this famous book of uh, uh, Hanafi, you know, uh, Hanafi book uh, about Islamic law, Al-Hidayah. You know, Al-Hidayah, so in that book, the author says, Al-Dalil Al-Ma'akul, rational delil, you know, rational argument. And then he says, Al-Dalil Al-Mankul, the uh, religious uh, 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 argument. Uh, so in every subject, he goes systematically, you know, in explaining, okay, so let's say adultery is bad, haram. So what's the rational argument for this? And uh, then he explains why adultery is bad, you know. And then uh, Dalil al manqul the religious argument, why adultery is bad. Let's say interest, it is haram. Why interest is bad from rational perspective? Dalil al maqul And then Dalil al manqul from the religious, uh, you know, uh, reasoning uh, perspective. So, you know, they combine both, uh, especially in the Hanafi fuqh, you know, uh, because they are ahlul ray, you know, uh, people of opinion, uh, so they always combine both uh, in their explanation of the issues, uh, and they show the hikmet, you know, the reason why uh, this is so, and this is uh, called the hikmet tashriya. You know, the wisdom beyond or behind legislation, divine legislation. You know, uh, uh, you know, Allah Ta'ala and uh, his messenger makes tashri'a legislation, but Allah is al-hakim. You know, everything he does is based on al-hikmah. You know, there is a reason for it. You know, he doesn't do anything uh, without any reason, without any uh, justification, without any uh, maslaha, you know, uh, benefits uh, for uh, people. Uh, uh, some fiqh books, they expose these things from a rational perspective, and uh, some of them expose from a uh, religious uh, perspective, some combine both. But most of the like Hanafi books, they combine both uh, in, in, a, uh, in, in every subject, uh, they explain why this should be so. You know, uh, and what are the benefits? What are the hikmah uh, like involved in this uh, issue uh, from uh, empirical, purely rational perspective? Because this is the common ground, and this is how we introduce uh, those norms to non-Muslims. Then uh, the religious perspective, al dalil al maqul, al dalil al mankul, together. Brilliant. Well, thank you for that. I think um, probably, uh, I think those are all the questions. Uh, just one of my thoughts that you have triggered today, actually, uh, interestingly, the, the relationship, the Islamic perspective on the on the heart being participant with, with thinking as well as the, the obviously the brain. And as a medic uh, schooled in the, the reductionist way of looking at the human body, uh, you know, I'm, it's quite interesting because I'm often troubled by um, the way we approach psychology and psychiatry and mental health within medicine. And often I find that the, the approach to deconstruct a person's mental health is ultimately reduced down to molecular level sort of interactions and lack of serotonins uh, and, and, and X, Y, and Z um, sort of, uh, you know, molecules in the brain. And, and, you, and what I find often a patient sees a psychiatrist comes back to me and says, Doc, they didn't listen to me. This wasn't my problem. And often sometimes an approach to their, when, when I spend time listening to them and, and sort of give a slightly different perspective from life experience, often they say, you know what, that was more helpful to, to me than my discussion with the psychiatrist. And I'm no psychiatrist. 
and sometimes connecting with the heart and the mind together uh, actually has a greater impact. And I think uh, it'll be interesting to actually study uh, the whole concept of psychology. And I know that there is that there are uh, scholars within that field of Islamic psychology and looking at it from a, a very holistic approach to it. But no, you've triggered off a thought. I'll, I'll look into that. So any anyone else? There's a iPhone question, <laughs> P0068276. Whoever you are, please lower your hand, uh, unmute yourself. And I'll take this as a last question today, actually. Uh, but do, please do identify yourself other than the number on your iPhone. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Farah and I am uh, attending this Zoom session from uh, Toronto. Thank you, Farah. And, uh, and uh, I do like your uh, last comment about uh, uh, Islamic psychology and how it centers the heart in terms of uh, dealing with the mental health. Um, we know that uh, the Western world has been able to prove everything scientifically. So now when we engage with uh, people from the Western world and we try to convince them that the heart also has a, a big role to play in, turn, in, in the field of philosophy and psychology, how are we going to get to convince them, especially when we all know that they don't have like... Uh, the foundation of all our approach, which is faith, Islamic faith. How do we engage in a dialogue with non-Muslims to be able to um, prove that the heart is at the center of philosophy and psychology? Mm -hmm. yes. uh, yeah, this is a very important question. And actually, uh, you know, there are uh, uh, psychologists uh, working on this question from different religions and they call their effort integrated psychology. So like integrating spirituality with psychology, uh, which uh, was like uh, self-evident, let's say 100 year ago. <laughs> but today it is something we need to prove uh, once again. So there are Christians, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, and also Muslims, you know, working on this integrated psychology uh, perspective. And our, uh, we have like uh, very good friends, Human Keshavarzi, Raina Awad, and uh, Abdullah Rotman, and many others, and Malik Badri, uh, you know, he, he, who is their sheikh, <laughs> he, like uh, the, the first person who was the critical of this uh, materialist uh, psychology, separating spirituality from uh, psychology and psychiatry. Uh, so these people, uh, they are all involved from different religious traditions to integrate, you know, psychology with uh, spirituality. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, what's unique with them is that uh, they don't reject the gains of modern psychology. You know, they are simply integrating it with spirituality. Uh, so they have a multiplex perspective to uh, human ontology and to uh, psychology. And I'm very hopeful about their uh, efforts uh, because uh, they are going beyond this uh, pseudo dichotomy, the false binary that you are either uh, focusing on psychology or spirituality. They say, no, why not both at the same time as two different uh, levels? Uh, uh, and, uh, and they are doing uh, good works. You can check uh, the works of human Keshavarzi, human Keshavarzi and uh, Abdullah Rotman and uh, Raina Awad and many others uh, uh, who are working uh, on this. Uh, and actually, Rutledge published a book edited by Human Keshavarzi and his friends. It's a very interesting book uh, uh, on this uh, subject. Uh, it might help you uh, 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 better understand uh, that question. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to draw this session to a close. Uh, it is getting late for some people, and I guess a bit early for others. Uh, I thank uh, Professor Rajab Shantuk for his excellent lecture today. It definitely has whetted the appetite of many and will probably have raised more questions than answered. Um, uh, we uh, hope that the audience um, basically enjoyed today and will go away uh, and uh, maybe recap the lecture on uh, which will be posted on YouTube 
and you can also join our uh, group uh, uh, on the WhatsApp group to get an update. Um, so the, I thank everybody for making uh, or asking their questions and, and making their comments. Our next lecture will be on the 6th of June, uh, or Monday, uh, 6th of June, on the topic of multiplex human ontology. So again, I thank everybody for uh, uh, coming on today and participating in this, and I look forward to seeing you all uh, at the next lecture. Uh, thank you very much and good evening to all. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you.